Hello, welcome to TechShare Pro session two, day two. Um, we've just had an amazing session about e um, employee resource groups. If you missed that, that recording will be available. Um, talking about res employee resource groups and champions networks. Um, and a really great way to start the day. Um, t right now we're going to talk about policy and strategy. Um, there'll undoubtedly be mention of carrots and sticks. Um, which is a subject we've returned to a lot over the years at TechShare Pro. Um, so really we're going to try and get an update on where things are at and also just a broader perspective on what's working and um, what we can do more of together to make change happen. So I've got a great panel. Um, I've got uh, Robert with me in the studio. I've got Celia and Ryan with me online. So uh, we're going to crack on. Um, let me start with you, Rylan. Um, if Could you introduce yourself? Um, we chose you because you're furthest away, so um, <laughs> that, could you tell us a bit no. about the work you're doing uh, and also, you know, your perspective? I know you've been on sort of both sides of the coin in the sense of working within Microsoft, but also working in with advocacy organisations before. So what role can policy make, do you think? Uh, what, what, sorry, what role can policy play in making change happen? And, and, and maybe from those two perspectives, it'd be interesting to see how they compare. Yeah, so I'm Rylan Rogers, and I'm the Disability Policy Advisor for Microsoft. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., in the United States. So not at all a boring place in terms of what's happening in policy. And um, you're right, I have spent the majority of my career in disability, not-for-profits, NGOs, um, working as a disabled woman, really to push for policy change, because we often find that that um, structure and those requirements are helpful in building an accessible world. It is interesting in the space of technology that it has often moved faster than policy and the accessibility and adaptation and usefulness and sort of that virtual curb cut effect um, is active and in place. And now we're seeing a lot of energy across the globe to say, how do we ensure that it is accessible and available, um, sort of accessible in all the ways, the ability to get it and the ability to use it for all people, including all people with disabilities. So there's this bit of a catch up that's currently happening globally about what the world looks like now and how do we think about regulations and policy to make sure accessibility is happening. And really, in some ways, um, the technology industry has been doing the work and moving forward. And so we're in the, I love the word sort of harmony when I think about po good policy and how does it work well around the globe. And so how do we get what's working well from industry to be part of our political structure and our regulatory structure? And how do we make sure that both things continue to move forward at the pace that we all need them to? Mm. So it's great to be here. Well, yeah, and you, and you, t you hinted at the, the pandemic effect, which um, is, you know, is mentioned fairly routinely these days in, in, in all circles, I guess. Do you feel that's harmonized, has brought people up to the same speed? Is it, is it also sort of shone a light on where the gaps are between you know, policy and, and reality of sort of daily lives of disabled people? Yeah, I think you see both. Um, we absolutely have seen a massive acceleration, and some of that is, impacts everyone with or without a disability. So the digitalization of our world, you know, how we've gone to school, how we work, um, how we interact with buying things, it, it rapidly changed. And we did see some of those quick wins for people with disabilities who might, might have been a workplace accommodation or um, an, an adaptation in the past. Um, might be now seen as what's universal and available to everyone. But at the same time, we saw that gap. Who has access? And not just physical access, but the training and resources needed to effectively use what's happening in technology. Um, and the other reality of all the great things that are happening is that it's about change. And change takes support and awareness. Um, so there can be great things built in to many devices and services now. I think there are great things built into many Microsoft products. But if people don't know they're there, if employers aren't using them to support disabled talent, we're not moving forward. So that can be part of the policy regulation as well to make sure that people are getting access to what they need and the support to use it well moving forward. Oh, thank you. Well, that, that's a fantastic way of kicking off because I think that does illustrate that, that need for policy to be in harmony. That, that's a nice way of describing it. Um, Celia, uh, thanks for joining us. 
could you tell us a bit about um, the work that you're doing and also this idea about how we connect it, you know, between those different stakeholders that Ryland's suggested there and particularly from your perspective, you know, how those connections can be made? Hi everybody, um, my name is Celia. I am the co-founding director of the Disability Policy Centre um, and what we do is we work to put accessibility and disability at the heart of Westminster and government and put the policy agenda. Um, a quick visual description of myself, I am a white woman with longish brownie blondie hair, I'm wearing a green jumper and a white shirt underneath and I'm sat in front of a blue wall. Um, I think it's a really, really interesting conversation that's happening at the moment is we are seeing tech become automatically incorporated within policy, which I think is really interesting. So when we look at tech outside of the policy sphere, what we're seeing is, you know, iPhones now have screen readers built in. Siri was originally designed as an accessibility feature. And all of these A tech features are becoming part of everybody's daily life, whether they realize it or not. And what's happening as a consequence of that is the, the profile and understanding and the understanding of the usefulness of a tech and accessible technology is being incorporated within the policy that we are making as a country and around the world. So, for example, if we take policy around um, web regulations, if we take policy around send provisions, if we take policy around university provisions for disabled students, every aspect of policy that is being created in some way incorporates technology and accessible technology, whether that's what as a society can we provide to people or what as a as a society can they provide for us and what we're really seeing is this very fast movement towards the automatic incorporation of accessible technology which is fantastic but i also think it's worth noting that we are seeing a widening of the gap of those able to access that technology because in its initial phases technology like that is expensive and not everybody can afford to have technologies such as expensive laptops or expensive phones or whatever it may be additional equipment that you might have so we are seeing a widening of that gap especially in the cost of living crisis so one of the policy conversations that's really kicking up at the moment is how do we make the, the accessible technology that's being automatically incorporated into policy actually available for everybody. Mm. Uh, interesting, you've, you've made me remember we've got access to work talking at lunchtime, you know, and that programme and its approach to technology and the availability of technology in the workplace. That type of stuff is that shift between policy and practice, isn't it? So, you know, where, where do disabled people get the support they need when they're trying to access work? And then what does the policy do in terms of guiding that? And the resources behind it clearly would be then you know, another gap is, does access to work have the resources to support the people who might want access to that technology as a technology is accelerating in terms of capability? Um, and uh, just taking, um, in terms of your perspective in your organisation, is there particular stakeholders you think need to be connected more? I mean, you know, the advocacy groups, the policy makers, um, how does that play out with you and the work that you're doing? Absolutely. I think there needs to be a drive forward in the communication that's happening between disabled people, their communities, new accessible technologies that are happening. So one prime example that we've seen a lot and a conversation that's happening over and over again is around the banking sector at the moment and the removal of the high street. That's not you know, solely isolated towards banking, but it is one of the big topics of conversation at the moment is on one hand, banking is becoming more accessible because you know you don't have to go down there physically in person anymore. But actually, let's not forget that the majority of disabled people, it's not actually a physical mobility difficulty. It could be something entirely different. And this digitalization has thrown up a number of barriers. So what's really, really important is that stakeholders must be engaging with government and with policy leaders and larger corporations such as banks that are observing and uptaking these new technologies that are developing so there are some incredible apps that are developing at the moment and accessibility um, that can be incorporated into existing apps for um, online banking so it's really important that we get that stakeholder relationship between the public sector that are overheading and figureheading and organizing and regulating you need to create that nice connection between the public sector, the private sector, and then also community organisations or seed organisations that haven't yet got where the funding where they need to be, but are developing the most incredible technology. It's about creating a nice synergy and a nice line of communication mm. between three avenues. 
Uh, it's interesting, uh, just to pick up on that, it's interesting that you didn't mention the tech companies, because I think that's, I'm wondering whether they're working at different speeds, because, you know, certainly our view of, of, of Riley and the way you describe Microsoft and the work you're doing, I mean, that's driving forward the innovation in the technology. So in a sense, that's what everybody's aiming for to have next. Whereas perhaps in policy, and in particular in the community organisations you're describing that are trying to support people at the front line, maybe their ambition and their um, goals and their day-to-day -day reality is very different. They're, you know, they're not, they're not even trying to get to the latest cutting-edge technology. They're simply trying to fill a gap like the digital divide and simply having access to um, uh, bandwidth, for example. Um, there's, there's a broadband campaign that O2 is running this Christmas to try and provide uh, SIMs for people. So that, that's quite a big gap between Microsoft pushing ahead with all of its innovation and the real life of the people in day-to-day in, in, in -day life. And maybe things like banks and finance, financial services are actually a part of the join to some extent. Um, but I think that's, that, that's a great point, Celia, and also the, the network that needs to be connected up. Do, do you see the, the advocacy, advocacy groups coming forward and joining in this conversation? Is that part of what we need to do, is to promote and, and encourage that? Or are they already at the door waiting to come in and have the conversations, do you think? Either one of you, I don't know, in terms of your so, respective I'll, inputs. I would love to jump in because I think Celia's point is excellent. And really, it's yes and. Um, absolutely that Microsoft is moving forward and fast, and some of our tools are part of the conversation of what happens in banking and other industries. But it is critical for us that disabled voices are a part of what we're developing and a part of how we're talking to other lines of business. And so that's both in terms of employees and you know making sure that our talent includes a broad perspective of disabled experiences because we know that that makes better products, but it's also why we invest so heavily in relationships with the disability community because this cannot be effective if it's not a partnership. And I loved that really important point that it has to be across so many different sectors. I think the other critical point is that it's not um, one thing. You know, disability comes in such a variety of experiences. And so when we're thinking about accessibility and accessible by design, it's not, it cannot be limited to one disability experience. It has to be multifaceted and that requires a variety of voices. So we need to make sure that we're really incorporating voices from different lived experiences and that expertise to drive policy, to drive good technology, and to be in the community making sure that people are getting those pieces of technology that they need. So it's again about that partnership and that synergy, but it really can't be one or the other. And then the other important piece, and I, we, Celia alluded to it a little bit, is where this place to me, and it feels a bit like a turning point where it used to be as a disabled person, you would buy lots and lots of aftermarket assistive technology. And now you're seeing more and more of your needs might be built in by design. Perhaps that's going to cost in a different way. So there's that tension about who pays for what. But there's also the tension that for many folks, you still need that and assistive technology, so making sure it works well together. And that often comes up in regulation as, as well in policy change, because it will never be the case that separate assistive technology is not needed, even though we're getting to greater accessibility by design. So it will always be sort of that yes and. Mm, thank you. Um, Robert, I'm going to come to you. We, we, were, we had a, a reception opening Tech Share Pro on Monday night, and we were joined by the minister, newly minted minister, um, and uh, he said some worthy things, as ministers do when they open public events like that. Um, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking about the uh, sort of quite complex picture that Celia and um, Ryan are painting of where he sits in the, in the middle of this great big jigsaw of all these different stakeholders and people he's got to listen to and things he's got to weave together. I mean, it, it, could you introduce yourself? Because your, your, your input, I think, is about how realistic some of this change is in the sense of policy. How, how can this come together? And I'm also particularly thinking about what we can do in the UK principally, but people online are from all over the world. You know, what can they do within their respective parts to, mm. to bring that together? It's a very complicated picture that you guys have painted. Somebody sitting in the middle of that trying to make policy, it feels to me, is going to be quite tough right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Robert. Um, I'm director of the Assistive and Accessible Technology Policy Lab at Policy Connect, which is a cross-party think tank. Um, 
to yeah, it was great to have the new Minister Tom Persgrove uh, at the reception. Um, one of the things that we do at Policy Connect is um, support the all-party parliamentary group for assistive technology here in the UK, and the chair of that group, Paul Maynard, introduced the minister, so there was a nice kind of um, link there uh, from, um, if you like, somebody on the back benches who's able to kind of um, be a bit more uh, challenging of the right. government. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the minister, who's obviously, who's obviously got the decision-making power. I suppose one thing I would say... Um, is one of the things that came out in the speech was that the minister reiterated a kind of a overall vision or um, desire from the government to, in, in his words, um, help make the UK the most accessible place in the world to live and work with technology. So apologies, Rylan, it's a competition. And we're going <laughs> to win. Um, but regardless, of what that does, I think, is not just that's great to hear that level of ambition. But also, I think, going to a number of points that have been made, it means that if you have that sense of things, it's not just the policies that are tagged with disability or technology that come into play. Because if you really want to make the UK the most accessible place in the world using technology uh, to live and work, then that brings in everything. Um, and I think that's an approach that we take, is a kind of um, no stone unturned. You know, we love... Uh, the policies that have the big kind of disability and, and or tech badge on them, and we want to work on how we can improve things like access to work that, that you were talking about. Um, but often the times when we find policymakers get really excited about what a, a, a assistive and accessible technology can do is where we talk to them about a challenge that they've already recognized, and we say, you could do so much more here if you, if you change the policy so that it leverages the technology that's already out there so that people can get better support. And, and financial technology is a great example. The Treasury in the UK has, has put up £10 million um, in partnership with uh, the City of London for a centre for financial technology. You know, we've already begun talking before it's been set up about you know, what, what could be the inclusion part of that. So we're a bit predictable insofar as anything that's going on, we're the people who pop up and say, well, have you thought about assistive and accessible technology here? Yeah, yeah. But more importantly, what in particular is the angle? Um, you know, could it be to the points that have been made about how disabled people engage in policy, how technology facilitates that, you know, taking on, you know, the challenge of net zero and, you know, what does accessibility look like at COP and other things like that. There really is no... Um, we, we really can't get boxed in to any particular kind of area. I do have a few kind of hobby horses of areas where I think there's kind of particular opportunities at the moment, um, but, um, but we, we don't need to restrict ourselves You're at all. You're very welcome to give me one. <laughs> well, I guess I'll, 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 I'll give you two since okay. you've uh, set me up. Um, <laughs> I mean, one is, of course, employment, which is really important. We've seen a, a, a trend where um, record numbers of people in the UK are on long-term uh, sick. Um, many people over 50 have uh, left the labour market following the pandemic. Um, apparently one in five of people in that position are on, are on waiting lists for some kind of NHS treatment. So it gives you some idea of the correlation there between health, potentially, and disability and workforce participation. And some of those people would want to go back to work and some wouldn't. And, Many have said that they would want to come back to work flexibly. So that, those two kind of um, societal trends, if you like, are recognized by policymakers, including policymakers who don't think about assistive and accessible technology. This is already on their plate. Yeah. So this is where one of those examples where we can say to them, you can do more. And I think that um, areas such as um, short-term work placements, where people get to try out um, uh, uh, some employment, work coaching, are areas where I don't think we've taken enough advantage. To some extent, um, be I think access to work has <laughs> siloed assistive technology off a little bit so that the... I used to be an assistive technology trainer in access to work. Um, I think that the, what happens is people get the training, but sometimes the coaching that they get isn't reinforcing that because maybe the coach isn't familiar with some of the, yeah. um, the tools that are out there. Another, which I'll sort of crib from my colleague Clive Gilbert, who spoke yesterday on your panel about media, is the whole kind of care tech agenda. 
Um, and actually, I kind of use that word, but I sometimes kind of flinch a little bit when I do, because whenever I'm in a conversation with people in the care tech world, they're doing really amazing things, digitizing care records, and so on and so on. But very often, as Clive has pointed out, the assumption is that this is technology that's used by care professionals rather than technology that's in the hands of disabled people who are receiving care. Mm -hmm. And there's a really significant amount of investment going into technology and care, and it's not clear how much of it yet is getting into the hands of, of care recipients. Mm -hmm. And yet, of course, that's what's going to allow people to be much more independent. That's, uh, that, I really like that, those examples because I think what they do for me, um, thinking about, again, thinking about who's in the audience, is it sort of gives everybody a point to go and say, well, it, you know, my bit is this. I'm, uh, this, is the, this is the policy area I'm broadly con uh, connected to, whether it's because I'm representing a particular point of view from a particular community or whether it's because I'm a tech provider and thinking about how I can uh, ac access a market, if that's the particular angle on it. Um, and it's, uh, I guess the, the challenge is, it's, you're pretty much talking about everything that's going on and broadly under the policy banner of all that happens in, in, in every part. And I, I wonder whether there is a value in picking something like workplace. Um, certainly in AbilityNet, we focused on that a lot more. Um, six years ago when we started TechShare Pro, we had almost no discussion about workplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that the value that work and the independence that that can bring to, to disabled people is a key element of changing the quality of people's lives. So it, it felt like that's why we picked one amongst 101 different things that we could focus on. And I wonder whether that's also a tactic that we could sort of continue to promote and say, look, actually, this is a point where a lot of different things come together for people's lives. And of course, it does activate their independent, uh, their, their own independence in a lot of ways. But um, uh, I'm, we've got a little while left. Uh, uh, Rylan, I'm, at that point about workplace, do you, do you see that similarly in the US? Because I think that's where, uh, what we, neither, none of us has mentioned yet, I just point out, we're talking about policy and nobody's mentioned the EU. So um, <laughs> your, your, yours, is a, yours is a role that presumably has some connection. I'm just remembering that we met in Brussels. So, you know, in what way do these jigsaw pieces play together? And I wonder whether workplace is a way of just making sense of some of those challenges and connections that need to be made. Yeah, I think that um, I appreciate that that's sort of a, a thread that we all share because it absolutely is I a global know. issue. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little quiet. That was my fault. No. Okay, I'm going to try again. You carry on. Um, you know, the workplace issues is absolutely a global thread that we all share. You know, we know that there is a tremendous disability divide in terms of workforce participation and using the talent of disabled workers in really every economy. And given the state of the world, each business and government are looking at that talent and looking at how do we close that gap. And we're seeing people address that in really innovative ways. Um, but it's an effort where we really need to think about it holistically. So I appreciate that you mentioned the European Union. You know, they are moving forward at, at an exciting pace. They have the European Union Accessibility Act. It will be fully in place in 2025. Member states are transposing it. So we're starting to see some of the digitalized impact of that in terms of employers, government, procuring or buying things with real intentionality that it becomes more accessible to empower workers. There's that question that you see, you know, back to the fact that we need to be working closely with communities, really educating folks about what's possible and how employers are interested in using their talents and what the tools are to bring their talents forward. So you're seeing those discussions happen at a policy level about what are some of the, in some cases, the benefit systems modernization to remove barriers to work, the um, appropriate support to accommodations and technology to move, remove barriers to work, and then really supporting workplaces in becoming fully inclusive to move forward. So that's both policy, employment policy, um, technology policy, social policy, but also it's about making sure the tools are in place and moving forward. And it is absolutely a theme that you are seeing globally. We're seeing that in the United States. Um, we're in what's called a lame duck Congress in between our election periods. And one of the things that we expect to pass is a reauthorization of something called the Assistive Technology Act. So you're seeing these trends of attention and it's really driven by the reality that we're in a new place thinking about the talent of disabled workers, and we don't want to lose that opportunity to bring all of that talent to our communities and our lives. Cool, thank you. And the global perspective, as you say, 
it does give, uh, you know, gives us all a sense that there is a priority in this area and that the, the change can happen as well, because I think part of the challenge is obviously working, uh, uh, bringing it back again to the day-to-day -day relative working with people with disabilities and trying to understand their needs is trying to say, well, look, it is possible we can make something of this. I think that's the gap as well, isn't it? The, 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 the trying to help people directly in the day-to-day -day sense and looking at this big picture of all the policy going on, there's a big gap there. Um, Celia, you presumably sit in the middle of that gap as well and you see that um, uh, every day. I'm wondering whether um, it makes sense to, to, to the organisations you're working with. I'm particularly thinking about the advocacy groups. Do, do they need more support in terms of understanding the stuff we're talking about around technology? Is there a gap there in their knowledge about the, the capability of technology that we could be closing, at, you know, in the sense of just joining that chain in, in a way? And also, is workplace you know, the place that they'd want to start? Is that something that they're going to sort of reflect and say that's actually a good place for us to understand these issues? Absolutely, and I think you touched on something really important there is almost an information gap in accessible technology and from my experience of speaking to people, it is very large, particularly within the older generation of accessible technology and development of new technology doesn't tend to be headline news unless you operate in this space and you are aware of it and you're connected with those relevant individuals. So an individual that is in operating entirely out of this space in a completely different field may not be aware of new developments that are happening. And I think the burden of responsibility of knowing and understanding is not on that individual, it's on the tech companies or it's on their employers to say, you know, we, there are new ways in which we can adapt your environment, there are new things in which can be provided for you. And I think employment is one of the biggest areas that we need to hit but I think we we always need to remember going back to what Riley was saying is that not all disabilities are the same and not all people's accessibility needs and demands are the same so even though flexible working is fantastic that is not the only form of accessible technology that can be implemented into somebody's life to to boost their employment or to make it easier for them to go back to work or work longer or whatever it may be is that we need to remember there is a plethora of examples but it's not just that disabled people need the education and understanding of what's available to them it's also employers and people operating in the policy sphere must be educated in this country less than two percent of our members of parliament identify as disabled and you know within councils it's around 15 percent and when you look at that comparably to the number of disabled people in this country there's a massive underrepresentation. And what happens with that is there's a knowledge gap and there's a representation gap, which means information isn't necessarily trickling down as we want to see it trickling down. So to counteract that, whilst we are working to improve disabled representation, effective consultation representing the diversity of disability. And I think companies, policy leaders and right down to community organisations need to get better at making sure they are representing all disabilities when they are performing consultation. But I 100% agree that I think there is that knowledge gap, but the burden of responsibility shouldn't necessarily fall on the disabled person to go out and educate themselves. Yeah. They should be made aware of what's available to them. Thank you. Thank, um, Robert, just closing, um, in terms of uh, the, the conversations we've got there, um, is there a place for, for people to engage? I mean, it, I'm just thinking in the UK because we're based here. Where, it, it, where we're seeing this knowledge gap and information gap, is there an obvious connection into the policy networks that you're part of? AppGet, for example, and, and how porous is that? How open is that sort of space um, in terms of people in the, in the audience from a community organisation thinking, well, how do I help close that gap from within the, within the community that I'm part of? Is there an obvious way to help make that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, Celia will agree that think tanks like ours really only work when it's not just the think tankers who are, who are doing it. It has to be um, really a network. Um, and so we um, you know, both of our respective think tanks look to engage with stakeholders and, and kind of be open to that. Um, so whether that's sort of roundtables and workshops and things like that, I mean, really practically, obviously, we can share information, you know, on our kind of websites and, 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 and emails to, to get in contact. But yes, you've got an all-party parliamentary group. You've got kind of report uh, processes like the report on special <laughs> educational needs and disabilities that that Celia and her team recently published and, and uh, projects coming up at, at Policy Connect, such as a report on um, awareness training for frontline professionals that we're working on and, and, and one on uh, short-term work placements and also come and bug us about things we're not doing reports about and, and should be interested in. Yeah. And, and finally, you know, one of the things that I find um, really um, 
great to see is when people within their organizations are developing an internal policy or an internal strategy and they want to um, bolster that by aligning it with uh, UK or, or global policy and we're always ha happy to sort of help people do that. I think that's one way in which people who are not full-time policy people can nonetheless benefit from engaging because if you're that person in your organization who's always saying what about accessibility and so on then policy when it backs up accessibility can be a great way of saying it's not just me I'm not just some kind of rogue yeah. <laughs> this is a load of other people think this too absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know and they're, they're sort of sitting there in kind of ermine uh, furs <laughs> in the house of lords so you know I can't be uh, that far uh, yeah Brilliant, thank you. Well, a brilliant conversation. Thank you so much, Ryan and Celia, for joining us, and Robert for joining us in, in the studio. Um, I, I think, um, do you know what? I don't think we mentioned carrot and sticks, which is really interesting because that's usually what we end up with is, you know, do we need bigger sticks? Do we need bigger carrots? But actually, it feels like it's more about collaboration and connecting up, maybe picking some priorities to really highlight so people the, raise the awareness, as you say, about how powerful the tools can be when they're in the right hands with the right support which I think is a slightly more positive message than when we end up debating carrots and sticks. It's much more about connecting up and joining across those different divides. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great session and uh, look forward to catching up with you all soon. Thank you.